Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Sir. It's time for family conversation. I love oh, yes. it. Huh? Happy Joshua. You don't hear it? There we go. <laughs> it's live and well. Can't have it too close or it pops. Let's stand together as we start tonight here in the sanctuary. You at home, uh, you can bow your heads in prayer as we get ready to pray and ask the Lord for his anointing on our time together this evening. It's great to be able to come together and talk about the Lord and discuss some yes. important things that are happening in our lives as we walk with him. Yes. Lord, we thank you tonight again for this opportunity that you've given us to come together to worship you above all and to learn from you. We're here because we know we need teaching, we need training in our lives, we need to develop uh, the character of God in our hearts. So Lord, we submit to you tonight and we ask you to move by your Holy Spirit, reveal to us the truth that you have for us this evening through the word and through our time of discussion. We pray that you will be a part of everything that we do tonight and that you will be lifted up and your name praise in Jesus name amen, amen. you may be seated we're on chapter number two of our not chapter number three I should say of our book uh, bondage breaker and uh, but before we get started you got anything I didn't have either so I don't you don't have to no that's why I was looking just one moment people at home Pastor managed to mess up from the right. No, you didn't. You're perfectly God's eye. It's not just single fruit. Yeah. It should be made. I set it at 2 30. But I know what happened. There's something going on with the internet here today at the church. Hi, Casey. Hi, Lenny. How are you? Oh, it's good to recognize you with your hair. Oh, I know. That looks nice. Thank you. I've got to be wearing glasses to work if I can do it. Okay, you should have it in your email any second now. <laughs> yes, it constantly fails you. <laughs> yes. So it shows that I sent it in 246. Oh, well. I sent it to, to you and to Xander. Oh. We'll live with it. If it doesn't come through, it doesn't come through. <laughs> if it does, at least you can see the notes up here. We're going to do it. Okay, to get started tonight, uh, this chapter is called, You Have Every Right to Be Free, uh, and some of you have the books in your hands, others uh, do not, which that's fine, uh, at least you got my notes. My notes are completely different than what Neil Anderson has <laughs> put in his workbook, so uh, that's all right too. <laughs> For sure. So, but the thing is, is there's so much in this book that really helps us understand how we can overcome in our lives yes. as we walk with God. Uh, he makes a statement today in, in this chapter that, uh, you know, a lot of times we accept Christ, we ask him to forgive us of our sin, but our life doesn't change. Right. We continue to live in the old nature rather than the new nature yeah. that Christ has given us. And that's something that we need to learn sometimes because we... Um, you know, in our society today, especially, there's a lot of spiritual ignorance. They don't understand 
what it means to really be a follower of Christ. Uh, you ask people what it means to, to accept Christ and they might be able to tell you or some, most of them aren't able to tell you. And, but when you lead them to the Lord uh, and they commit their life to Christ, they still don't understand what that really means. They pray and say, okay, yeah, I need to do that in my life. I've never done that. So they pray with you and they accept Christ. But unless they're discipled, there's no growth. There's yeah. no development in their, in their character. Yeah, so, so it's important that we learn to disciple, that we learn to teach, that we learn to come alongside those that uh, do come to know Christ yeah. as their personal Savior. At the beginning of this book, one of the things that I talked about was, do you know who you are in Christ? And I asked that question, who, who are you in Christ? And uh, we got some really good answers. Norma went home and she started studying and she learned a lot about who she was in Christ. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. and, and things that she already knew, but uh, was able to put scripture to it. And that's really valuable in your life too, as far as your teaching is concerned. Yeah. But at the beginning of the study today, there is a whole list of things that you are in Christ, who you are, well, and it really helps you. And we're not going to read all these scriptures because it would take all night and tomorrow night. Uh, so, what, but I want to go through it real quick. And uh, then it's your responsibility, since you have the copies, you can look up these scriptures, you can read them for yourself and the support that they are uh, for you in your life. So John chapter 1, verse 12, one of my favorites, I'll refer to it later on. I am God's child. Very important. John 15, 15, I am Christ's friend. Amen. Romans 5, 1, I have been justified. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, I am united with the Lord and one with him in spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 20, I have been bought with a price. I belong to God. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 12, 27, I am a member of Christ's body. I am, and then Ephesians 1, 1 says that I am a saint. Because Paul talks about being a saint and that we are saints of God that he's writing to the saints uh, in Ephesus. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5, I have been adopted as God's child. Ephesians 2.18, I have direct access to God through the Holy Spirit. And I stop there because many people in the body of Christ don't know what that really means and they don't understand the significance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Yeah. They are, you know, they hear about Jesus, they hear about God, but they don't really hear that much about the Holy Spirit. And again, unless they are in training or teaching and discipleship, they probably never will. Oh, yeah. And one of the reasons so many Christians struggle spiritually is because they don't understand the power of God. Now, you know, we know that when we come to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, the Holy Spirit yes. uh, is in us. Yes. But there's so much more than just Him bringing us to Christ and for us to know that He's now dwelling in us. But we need to activate the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Uh, and if we don't understand that, then we remain basically spiritually dead because we're not walking in the Spirit. We're still walking in the flesh most of the time or in our old nature, as Neil Anderson says. So that is really important. So that's Ephesians 2.18, that we have direct access to God through the Holy Spirit. Colossians 1.14, I have been redeemed and forgiven of all my sins. Amen. Not a few, not just the bad ones, all of them. or not just the good ones, <laughs> but all of them. <laughs> And we'll oh, can he buries our sins in the deepest depths of the sea. Amen. Deepest and depths of the sea. That's got to be pretty deep because they say the Marianas Trench is only seven miles deep. Yep. That's a long ways down there for those sins to be lodged on the bottom of the floor of the ocean. Amen? Yes. So it's important to leave them there. <laughs> Don't try to go down and find them. <laughs> Colossians 2.10, I am complete in Christ. That's a very pass very important passage of the scripture as well. So all of those scriptures are about being accepted before the Lord. The second category is I am secure. Romans 8 verses 1 and 2, 
I am free from condemnation. Romans 8, 28, I am assured that all things work together for good. Yes. Romans 8, 31 through 34, I am free from any condemning charges against me. And Romans 8, 35 through 39, I cannot be separated from the love of God. Yes. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, I have been established, anointed, and sealed by God. Yes. And Colossians 3, 3, I am hidden with Christ in God. Yes. Philippians 3.20, I am a citizen of heaven. Yes. 2 Timothy 1.7, I have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Right. Hebrews 4.16, I can find grace and mercy in time of need. And 1 John 5.18, I am born of God, and the evil one <coughs> cannot touch me. Amen. I'm thankful for the security that we have in Christ. Now, we, we believe that there's, there's some different lines of thought when it comes to theology again, as far as salvation is concerned. And we have Calvinism and Arminianism, which are two branches of uh, this whole thought of salvation and the security we have in Christ. I believe as long as you're serving the Lord and you're walking in Christ, you're about as secure as you possibly can be. Yeah. You wanna get off path and you choose to say goodbye to God, you're separating yourself from the Lord. Uh, Calvinism teaches that once you accept Jesus Christ, no matter what you do in your life, no matter what sin you commit, and when you die, no matter what, you're going to heaven because you That's accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I believe that, and of course, they tell us too, well, if that person really didn't walk with God, then they never really accepted Jesus. And that could be. <laughs> but I've seen people that have walked with the Lord, been very dedicated in their lives, who, for one reason or other, walked away from this wonderful privilege to be a part of the body of Christ. And they severed themselves from relationship with God. And scripture shows us that that can happen. There were some of the people that followed with Paul that turned their backs on God. So security is secure in Christ. Keep your eyes on him. Walk in him. Follow him. Know that he's Lord of your life and that you have security in Jesus Christ. First of all, uh, go ahead. Uh, revelations in the seven churches also, five churches were corrected by the Lord, say, repent. One church was obedient to the Lord to the point of death. And the other one, God warned them. Jesus warned them, said, hey, don't let no one take your crown. So it can be taken. Mm -hmm. So we got to be aware that there's some responsibility in our walk with God. It's not just a free ticket to heaven. Okay, Ron? And in Hebrews, well, uh, there was one, the, in the last days, folks would be falling away from yeah. the Lord and the bad naming and uh, decent Christians are to make sure that doesn't happen but to be faithful to the finish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 10.25. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's important to know that and understand yeah. so we don't always, we've got to be careful when we're talking about security or eternal security yes. uh, because there's different different understandings of what that means. Uh, and so I wanted to bring that out because we've got to understand that this walk with God is one that uh, calls for us to be responsible to him and walk in faith. So, so you know, because there's a lot of people, they get mad at God. I'm not going to serve God anymore. And then they... They get ready to die and say, well, I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior back when I was 10 years old, so I guess I'm okay. No. no. And you better get saved again before you die. <laughs> I agree. Uh -huh. But also, it's important for us to realize that salvation, I mean, if you make a mistake in your life, you lie to somebody or decide to pick up something off the shelf in the store and you forget to pay for it. <laughs> um, God's not going to kick you out of heaven because of that. No, no. Okay, But you do need to repent of your sin, right? Yes, sir. 
So our one sin is not going to keep you out of heaven because I believe the Lord's conviction will come on you and you will confess your sin and you will find that the Lord will cleanse you from unrighteousness in your life and you will walk with him. So uh, some people I know when I was growing up, they were scared to death every day that they had lost their salvation. So they were constantly getting saved again because they didn't know that they had security in their walk with the Lord. Yeah. So there's extremes on both sides. And we need to recognize that the balance is that when I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I can walk with him the rest of my life. Hallelujah. I'm so glad that I got saved when I was nine years old. Yeah. And my relationship with him today is stronger than it was then. Amen. And we just constantly are walking in God's grace and experiencing That's joy in our lives because of the like a great oak tree that keeps producing right to the end. Amen. <laughs> Tony? There's also another misconception of grace where they're teaching out there that you're not only forgiven of the sins you've done in the past, but also the ones in the future. But how can you be forgiven of the ones in the future so like until you commit them and actually repent them? All right. All right. I totally agree with that too. There's, and that's a big thing in the grace movement right now is that uh -huh. uh, yes. you've, you're saved by grace, so all of your sins have been forgiven no matter what they are in the future. And that again goes along with the eternal security thing because uh, if you think that your sins in the future are forgiven, well, again, when I then make mistakes, I don't have to ask God for forgiveness. He's already forgiven me. Uh, again, for, you're right, Tony, it's important to recognize 1 John 1, 9. We need to come to the Lord and confess our sin, and we know then that he's, he will forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from unrighteousness. So, confessing our sin is really important when we make mistakes in our lives. Okay? The, yes. Go ahead. I, I believe with all my heart, you know, that this uh, pandemic we are going through is a test of our, our faith, you know, you know, and it's, uh, it's scared. I talk to Christians, they're scared. They're scared, they're scared of that. And I said, you don't have to be afraid. God hasn't given you a fear of fear. Sometimes these things happen so that people can, you know, fall on their knees and cry out to God and get, and get, and get saved. And others come back to God. That's right. But, it, but it's for a purpose. It is. Amen. We have no well, fear, but the fear of self. <laughs> that's right. Okay, let's move on to the third category of these uh, scriptures that he's got down. Uh, I am significant. Yes. You're not just a number when it comes to Jesus Christ. Amen. Right. You're not just in some certain category. Uh, so many times in our world, uh, you know, we're a number, we're uh, designated by our jobs. Some people are, seem to be credited with more intelligence because of their specific position in a job than someone else who doesn't have that kind of a job. So, but in, in Christ, we are all significant. We're all important yes. to him. Matthew 5, 13, I'm the salt and light of the earth. John 15, 1 and 5, I am a branch of the true vine, a channel of his life. Hallelujah. Amen. Acts 1, 8, I am a personal witness of Christ. I you will <laughs> receive power from on high, and you'll be witnesses in Ju Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. That's right. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, I am God's temple. Ah, he dwells here. <laughs> He yeah, dwells in me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that for that privilege we have. Second yeah. Corinthians 5, 17 through 20. I am a minister of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. God has called us to reconcile, to bring reconciliation in our world. Yes. Well, we've got a lot of Christians that need to learn that little part. Because rather than being people of reconciliation, we have become so uh, polarized today. And we take our stand and we yell and scream what we believe and what everybody else believes is wrong. You know, and we, we make people, we basically ostracize people rather than bring them into a place of reconciliation in life. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 6, 1, I am God's co-worker. We work alongside of him. He works alongside of us. Ephesians 2, 6, 
I am seated with Christ in heavenly realms. Yes. I, I've preached that so much that you probably have those verses memorized. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2.10, I am God's workmanship. Yes. Not only are we saved by grace through faith so that it's not something that we do of ourselves, but when that's all done, then we're God's workmanship and he continues to, and we're created in Christ Jesus uh, to be able to do the works that he wants us to do. That's right. Ephesians 3.12, I, I may approach God with freedom and confidence. You don't have to be afraid of coming into God's presence. Amen. And Hebrews talks about that as well. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's nothing that you have to deal with in life that you're going to have to deal with alone. You have the Lord with you. So that's a great list of scriptures that help us understand who we are in Christ. And because of that, we are overcomers for, of anything that may be going on in our lives as we walk with God. Okay, now, um, there's four important character qualities that are affected by what we believe about ourselves that he brings out in this book today. Let me get to the page. Now that I've got them down, I've got the lines in. Beats me what they are. <laughs> so over on page 46, you are a child of God. And uh, he says down in about the second sentence, your attitudes, so you can write these down so you have them on your paper. Your attitudes, your actions, your responses, and your reactions to life's circumstances are greatly affected by what you believe about yourself. And for those at home, again, I'll, I'll read through those again. Your attitudes, actions, responses, and reactions to life circumstances are greatly affected by what you believe about yourself. If you have no self-esteem, if you have no confidence, you get yourself trampled on all the time. All the time. And it's because of how you feel about yourself. And then when somebody tries to correct you, rather than accepting uh, correctness as a um, constructive criticism, yeah. we let it humiliate us. We, we, you know, it's easy then for our attitudes to get negative and we fight back, we yell because we don't want to accept what somebody says. Yeah. Our, so many things, the, the way we feel about who we are affects how we act. And it's important for us then as believers in Christ to know who we are in Christ. That's why he gives us this complete list of things that are valuable in our walk with God. Because without it, we're going to be stumbling around not knowing who we are and not knowing how to overcome the enemy when he comes against us. Uh, to pull us down and to drag us down into the depths of darkness. Um, question. Who helps you know that you are a child of God? Holy Spirit. Read Romans 8.60. <laughs> Someone read that passage of scripture. You're right, Tony. Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Okay, so as Tony said, the Holy Spirit is the one who helps us know who we are in Christ. I jumped over something there. Uh, according to John 1, 12, what two things do we need to do to be given the right to become children of God? What two things are mentioned in that passage of scripture? For as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons, the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. So what are the two things you need to do to receive him? Hmm? Okay, yes, I said that wrong, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> to become a child of God, you need to receive Him and you need to believe. And believe is what? Faith. 
Yes. Rely on, cling to, and trust in. Uh, if you don't, and that's what true belief is. You can say, I believe, but boy, I sure got a lot of questions. You don't believe. <laughs> so, believe comes to a place where it activates faith in your life. You believe that things are possible that are seeming to be impossible. Things that you don't see, you know they're there. We know Christ exists even though we don't see him with our own physical eyes. We know the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity and he moves in our hearts and lives and he's like the wind. We can't see the wind, but boy, we can sure see the trees move, right? Yes. As they are tonight. So we, we know, we believe, and that believing makes it possible then for us to receive, but you cannot be a child of God if you don't receive him as being the Lord of your life, okay? Okay, so then uh, number four, since we are children of God, how does that affect our relationship with God and Christ? And that's verse 17 of Romans chapter 8. <laughs> Please. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, and heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. Okay, so we are heirs of God and we are co-heirs with Christ. Why? Why are we co-heirs with Christ? Because we're in him to the Father. The Father the can see. Of God. He don't see us, he sees him in us. Okay, that's a good thought. He was the first of the resurrection. What's that? He was the first of the resurrection. Okay. Christ was the first of the resurrection. We are also going to be resurrected as well. That's right. Okay. Anything else you can think of? What that means? It's called the child. Or he was the son of God. So we are children. And we are, yeah, that's the one I really wanted. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> okay. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. But we have been adopted into the family of God, and we are called sons and daughters or children of God, right? So that's what makes us co-heirs with Christ. And that, I remember back a whole bunch of years ago, where all of a sudden it dawned on me that what Jesus has as an inheritance, I also have. I, you know, the kingdom of God is for us. <laughs> it's not just for Jesus. Uh, the completeness, the fullness, the love, the power, the glory, and everything that is there for Jesus is also there for us as we walk with the Lord, because we are co-heirs with Christ. Praise the Lord. Co-heirs, co-heirs, co raises from the dead. So much. Okay, uh, moving on then. Uh, you are spiritually and therefore eternally alive. This is a good one. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, <clears throat> verse uh, 16. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. So what are the two parts of our basic nature that Paul refers to here? The outward man is perishing, mm -hmm. the inward man is being renewed. So we've got an outward man and we've got an inward man. What does he mean by that? Okay, so the physical versus the spiritual, right? So the spiritual part of us is something that has connection with God eternally, and those are the things that really count. The temporal things, as are referred to in King James Version, are things that just come and go. And uh, uh, sometimes we're really devastated when things go that we really have become attached to, right? All these people that love dogs. <laughs> when a dog dies, man, it's, it's doomsday. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I, I understand that whole thing because we've lost dogs. And oh, we've, got, <laughs> we've got Freya that's getting old. One of these days she's going to die. And that's hard. It really is. 
but those things pass away, but we're so attached to them. Uh, you might have a home, and for some reason or other, you lose that home. It's tragic in your life. When the Lord brought us out here to uh, uh, Yucca Valley and Joshua Tree, it took several months for Norma to feel like, wow, this can be home. Because she was so attached to our home in Corona. And we, she felt like she was losing that to come here. So we, things in the physical come and then they disappear sometimes and are gone. Yeah. Finding that most of the time we find something even greater than what we had before. If we keep that in the right logic in our minds. And things spiritually are things that are everlasting. They will never change and be taken away from us. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2 uh, and look at verse 1 and then verses 4 and 5. <clears throat> Go ahead. Everybody else seems to be quiet. They're, they're, they're seating to you. As for you, turn then in your transgressions and sin. And as before you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. Okay. Verse 4. 4 and 5. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Okay, so... What is the condition of our spiritual part before accepting Christ? Dead in trespasses. Okay, it's dead in trespasses, transgressions, whatever word you want to use there. Get dead. No, <laughs> no life. How bad. And why is that? Why is our spiritual part of us dead before we accept Christ? Sure. Hmm? Okay. And only Christ's forgiveness gives us life. Like no hope. We're we're roadkill because the devil has control of us. We're we're dead men walking in the world. Okay, very true. We're born in sin. We're born in sin. Uh, and that's again hard for some people to accept and realize. But because Adam sinned, then all sinned. So from the very beginning of time when disobedience took place and they disobeyed God and partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, sin became a part of the nature of man. Yeah. And so every person born, and when we use man there, it's not just us males, it's females too. Uh, when we were born, we are born in sin. Yeah. And we are separated from God, so we are spiritually dead. Right. You're, you're not spiritually alive in your own way, but we're dead spiritually uh, because of no relationship with God. That's right. Um, so, and it tells us though there, and I don't have this really in the, in the uh, questioning here, but there in verse 5, it says that we're made alive in Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. And it is by grace that you've been saved. So, what a privilege that even when we were still dead in our transgressions, Christ died for us. It tells us that in Romans chapter 5. So we have life in him because he already did this for us. It's just a matter of us recognizing it and, and then submitting to him and receiving right. what he has for us. So it's really important there for us. Okay, number three. What has God given us through his son, Jesus Christ? We have to turn to 1 John chapter 5. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Pretty clear, isn't it? <laughs> if you have Jesus, you have life. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. <laughs> John doesn't make any quibbles about it. It just simply is what he says. And it tells us that this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. So that's what God has given us through his son, Jesus Christ, is eternal life. Thank the Lord for that eternal life that we have, because now we're eternally alive in Christ. This is the point that Neil Anderson is trying to make here. Yeah. Okay, D, 
D. When I, when I, when I uh, first, my eyes really got open, I, I, I cried for a whole year mm. of God, to, you know, the cross and how, you know, how, how much he did for us and how deceived I was and, you know, and how to see my family was. And, you know, I mean, I just cried and cried. Um. I couldn't stop crying. <laughs> Uh, it's beautiful when repentance comes and we recognize what we have and, and we can call it, first of all, kind of sadness because of those who are deceived, but also tears of joy because of what we've yeah. experienced now in Christ. Okay, so D, we are a new creation in Christ. Uh, yes. One of our favorite verses we'll talk about in a minute, but let's first of all go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Somebody else read it besides Tony. Second, second, <laughs> Either one of us. <laughs> Come on, Tony. Second Peter. Second Peter chapter one verse now four. Now time to get to it. Come on. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by the wicked one. Okay. So just to make that a little bit louder so you can hear it good. Uh, through these, he has given us this very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. What do we now participate in as followers of Christ? The divine nature. I did a series of messages on that too here. So, it's been a long time, but uh, we do that series again and nobody know it. <laughs> People think we're crazy. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shucks. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's okay, we probably did. Probably. <laughs> yeah. You know, again, we. That's something that we don't really think about a lot, even as followers of Christ, because as Neil Anderson points out a lot in this book, is there's a tendency for Christians that are not informed to still live in their human nature, the fallen nature. We, we have accepted Christ, but we don't fully understand what that means, so we still live our lives <laughs> trying to be good in our human in our humanness, in and okay, I'll, uh, you know, I'll work hard, I'll do all the things I need to do, but it's all motivated by what's going on in the physical and the material part of our life. We don't understand who we are in Christ that makes it possible for us to do great things in Christ as we live our lives in the temporal world. So to recognize that we participate, it's not like the divine nature is out there someplace in the universe, but we participate in the divine nature of God. The new self, the new person that we are, the new nature that God has given, given us. Philippians, I mean, Ephesians talks about this in chapter 4, and, and also Colossians. Paul, in both of those books, just pounds home this thing of getting rid of the old life and understanding the new and living in the new nature of God. The divine nature of the Lord. And when we begin to understand the fullness of that, it can do nothing but bring joy and happiness and, to our lives and fulfillment uh, and a lot of peace too because we're walking in the presence of the Lord. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This is one of the passages of Scripture that is quoted so often when it comes to this whole thing of who we are in Christ. Uh, since we've accepted Christ, what have we become? A new creation. We have become a new creation. Yes. So now we're brand new in who we are in Christ. Yes. So Romans 6, 6, what happened to our old nature when we accepted Christ? Ha <laughs> ha! 
So if that nature was crucified with Christ, where is it today? Yeah, buried. Dead and buried. But we still dig him up and live in him. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> we still let him, let that old nature control a lot of our decisions. We let that old nature control our attitudes a lot. We, we, it's hard to keep the old nature buried. It likes to come up alive again. That's why Paul says we died daily. Yes, that's a good, now, good when, point. When, when I became a, a, a true kid Christian, I was a bad girl. Sometimes when I was a bad girl. I was a bad girl, I was bad. And uh, the people at my work came up to me and said, Froggy, you're not cursing. I said, no, I'm not saved. He said, you got saved? And I said, yes, I got saved last night. I, you know, I'm a Christian now. Well, they couldn't believe it. They said, "We just can't can't believe you're a bad girl anymore." I, I can't help it. I don't want to be bad. <laughs> <laughs> they probably would said, "Well, we'll see how long that lasts." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it lasted. <laughs> lasted for all these years. Praise God. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that that old nature has been put aside, has been crucified with Christ. And of course, Galatians 2.20, you already know that that's my favorite verse in Scripture. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Right. And I live this life, this physical life, by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Amen. himself for me. It's no longer my life here on this earth. Oh. It's his life. So since we were crucified with Christ, how do we now live? We live holy. We live blameless. Yes, we and we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave Himself for us. So our life is in Him fully and completely. And what a joy that is! It just brings so much peace in our lives. This chapter, uh, not really going to cover it because there's a lot of stuff in there that that I think is really good for reading purposes. Uh, we might take time since we do have time to look at this a little bit. Um, he ends this chapter by talking about these two significant points that I have in the closing thoughts. We can be victorious over sin and death. We can be victorious over sin and death, and that we can also be free from the power of sin. Uh, sometimes people act like that they don't even know how to resist sin, that sin has complete control over their lives. Yeah. But you're the one that makes the decision to do you're the one that, huh? It always starts in the thoughts. Mm -hmm. And we have to bring those thoughts to the suggestion to the readings of Christ. Amen. So, I, I got a road to the master's chair. That's what I got. <laughs> um, <laughs> in Romans 8 1 and 2, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So we are no longer controlled by sin, it tells us in scripture. Uh, and so we can actually have victory over sin. We have victory over death because death no longer uh, brings fear into our lives. We have victory over death because we know now as followers of Christ, we never die. All of you out there in the world that don't know about that, you need to get saved. <laughs> Our nature has been changed. We no longer have the sin nature. Right. That don't mean we can't <laughs> sin. That just means we don't have that nature no longer. We became a new creature. And sin no longer has, as we're going to talk about in a minute, it no longer has power over us. Yes. So, you know, we experience this new life in Christ. And that sin nature is no longer the one that is in control. It's the nature of Jesus like Christ and the Spirit back. of God. I'd like to get you back. <laughs> yeah, if we let him. I know it. Uh, it's like, it's so, this sin's desire <clears throat> is for you that you can rule over it. Another great, great series that I've done yes, here have. and did elsewhere as well in Romans chapter 6. It deals with. Uh, this whole picture of the sin nature being dead. Uh, we're no longer to yield ourselves as instruments to unrighteousness. 
but as instruments or members of righteousness. Romans 6, 1 through 11. Uh, let's take the time just to flip over there since I don't have that in the notes. He starts this off. I mean, this this whole chapter is really good all the way down through. Six but, and eight. Uh, huh? Romans well, six and eight. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Six six. Chapter six, beginning with verse one, it says, "What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase?" Yeah. By no means. No and way. I've told you different times that I think Paul yelled that. <laughs> At least his pen did. It must have been in capitalized. He didn't pull no preach Certainly not. <laughs> we died to sin. Yeah. How can we live in it then? You're a dead man walking. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're a live man. That is not dead anymore. <laughs> so, uh, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Yes. So because he raised from the dead, we also raise with him to newness of life. Yes. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Have you died? To the physical we have. And the spiritual has come alive. So if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For well, we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Amen. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So because we are alive in him, we are victorious over sin and death yes. and no longer have power over us. That's right. <clears throat> okay, over in the section then on you can be free from the power of sin. Um, Romans 7, verses 15 through 25, he goes through, and we're not going to go through this whole readout of this conversation that he has in, in this whole process of understanding what this all means but Paul is in this battle and it's neat that chapter 6 is about being instruments to righteousness chapter 8 is no condemnation the victory that we have in the Lord that we are children of God heirs of God joint heirs with Christ but chapter 7 is this spiritual warfare that's going on oh in our God. lives and he describes what is you know we want to do good but we find ourselves doing bad. Right. The things that we don't want to do, we end up doing. Yeah. The things that we want to do, we don't seem to do. And at the end, he cries out and says, oh, what a wretched man I am. Who can save me from this? And he says, Christ Jesus, amen. And it's all because of the law, because <clears throat> the law shows us that we're sinners. Mm -hmm. Right. The law is actually good because yeah. it shows us that we're sinners. We no longer live by the law because we live by the law of Christ and, and the law of love. Law. And so the, that's right. Christ fulfilled the law. So lo and behold, we fulfill the law, not because we're trying to keep the law, but because we live in Christ and Amen. Christ lives in us. So that's what gives us the power to be free from sin. So you can't be free from the power of sin. Sin no longer has control over you because Christ now lives in you and you live in Christ. So it's important for us to recognize that significance. So we can be victorious over sin and death and sin no longer has power over us as believers in Christ. We can walk in freedom. We can live our lives in the freedom of Christ 
living purely, holy, righteously in Him, because we've actually become the very righteousness of God. Amen? Praise God. Any thoughts, any comments as we get ready to close? Okay. Seems like since I've come to this church, God has answered a lot of things that I was, you know, wanting to know, but I didn't know. And God has help, helped me a lot to find out who I am in Christ Jesus. Praise um, yeah, God. You know, if, if I was in really heavy warfare, I'd say, God, so like, I'll, you know, I'm always in warfare. Why? You know, I... can walk in freedom hallelujah yeah um, next week we're going to be talking about the fact that you can win the battle of your mind uh, there's a lot of books out about this <laughs> Henry oh, Cloud and uh, Joyce Meyer and everybody else has written about the battle of the mind I love and so this ought to be an interesting chapter to talk about and to discuss next week as we look at uh, Christ winning that battle in our minds so we can then live in the purity of, of proper thoughts rather than be controlled by the negative stuff that so easily attacks us today it's kind of sad that Joyce Meyer has left the ministry not so much that she's left the ministry as far as serving Christ but she's no longer doing the teachings and, and, and everything else anymore what? I see her on air every week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even the soul was that what, what, what she's given up the actual uh, going out because of uh, there's too much flack coming at her for something she's supporting because well, CBD. It, it's 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 the, the not the hallucinogenic of marijuana, but the the wow. hemp where they talk about you know the the CBD uh, takes away pain and, and, uh, and uh, uh, swelling and stuff. I have to research that. <laughs> I have. It blew me away when I read it. When I find it again, I'll send it to you. Yeah. Um, Normally, the pain comes back. It's gone for a while. <laughs> it covers it up. Huh. <laughs> Just like every other I'll medication. <laughs> Oh, praise the Lord. Um, let's pray. Continue to remember Heidi in prayer. She's doing really well. I'm so glad she was able to be in church Sunday. Yeah. Let's continue to pray for her divine healing and that uh, she'll regain strength and energy in her body. And uh, Jesus is stronger. Well, the divine nature is sick. Amen. <laughs> um, any other special needs that you need to mention tonight before we pray? Anybody on Facebook watching anything that might be coming through on Facebook? <clears throat> okay, let's stand together and close this time together in prayer. It's been great to be together today in the presence of the Lord. Good discussion. <laughs> Very interesting topic. Praise the Lord. Drake, I'll ask you to close the night in prayer, would you please? God, we thank you again for the night and the ability to study your word today. And the fact that we thank you, Lord, for who we are in you. What that means to each and every one of us. We thank you, Lord, for the value that you give us and how much you love and care about us. Lord, help us to love and care for each other. Be with us the rest of this week. Let us back safely on our way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bye, Bob. Bye, Bob. Good night. Good night. <laughs>